unfiltered. Oh, hey, didn't see you there. I'm Joe Yarbrough. I'm not the host of this show, but the two guys who are, they're not experts, but they try their best. As far as they know, everything they say is true at the time of the recording. You're listening to the Beer History Podcast, hosted by David Tataro and Dennis Abdelhamid. And now, here are the hosts of the Beer History Podcast, David Tataro and Dennis Abdelhamid. Yay! We did it! Hey, to our first live show. We have never done this before. So it might well, be terrible. Some of us. <laughs> okay. I've never done this before. Dennis has a little more experience doing live recordings. I've done quite a few live streams, if you know what I mean. Whoa. Hey. <laughs> All right. I am, uh, as many of you know, David the belligerent boomer, Tataro. <laughs> and with me is my lovely assistant, <laughs> Dennis the Mandalorian Meatball, Abdul Hamid. Mandalorian Meatball? What? I can note that myself. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so we got an interesting show for you guys today. I've gotten a lot of comments from people talking about how they don't know a lot of basic beer stuff, uh, which that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I only judge you a little, but I'm here to help fix a lot of those issues. So we're going to go through some, some basic beer knowledge from... Uh, glassware to different kinds of beer styles, basic brewing info. Uh, and of course, we're going to talk about how to properly pour beer, which I think we're going to do that first because I would like to have a beer. So this is episode four, Beer 101. Beer 101. Hey. All right. So we have all this fancy stuff here, which, you know, like I said, this is our first time doing a live recording. So uh, we're going to try to, let's see. Ah, yeah, look at that. Uh, I guess <laughs> I thought you were. I was like, is he kicking me off already? <laughs> He's going solo. This stuff, See you, John this, Lennon. This stuff gets me excited. It's fun. All right. So hopefully everybody has a beer with them. Does everybody have a beer with them? We're watching the comments. So I saw Dom Amato on here. He's probably not drinking a beer. I imagine that guy's drinking a. I don't know. Hey, what, what do you Jocko, a Jocko energy drink or something. So here's what I've got. This is called uh, Unholy Triple. It's a, uh, a, it's actually a Belgian triple made in the U.S. Super good beer. I'm going to be pouring it into this goblet, which is the traditional glass that you pour Belgian Abbey ales into. We'll talk about those in a little while. But it's very simple. Pouring pretty much any beer is, is uh, essentially the same. You want to tilt your glass at about 45 degrees. If you guys have been following my quick pour series, you'll, you'll notice that often the pours come out quite good and sometimes they're terrible. So <laughs> pouring is, is a, <laughs> it's not an exact science. So there's a lot of factors that affect it. So start pouring it kind of slow. And what you want is eventually to get a nice big head. So if the head's not thick right off the bat, you want to raise the glass up high so that it thickens up. And there, that one came out nice, huh? Beautiful. Look at that head. So the head is important because uh, a lot of the uh, the aroma from the hops doesn't come out until you pour it and agitate it. Some of you guys might be familiar with wine. It's kind of a similar concept. You know, they put those uh, aerators on the bottle sometimes, and uh, it brings out a lot of flavor. So... Once you pour beer with a nice thick head, you, you just get all these aromas that you would never get if you were drinking out of the can or out of the bottle, like some kind of heathen. And there's one thing that we all like, and Delicious. that's head. <laughs> you know, I, that, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to do a quick story here. So for my beer, uh, I got this one. It's been in my fridge for a little bit. That is a great beer. And, Anchor uh, Brewing. If you guys saw the first episode, that is uh, considered the first craft brewery. I remember when Dave came over to my house, he, he brought some beers and I didn't have a beer opener. So he gave me this one and, I, and I've had it ever since. Can you imagine this guy? He's <laughs> co-host of a beer podcast. Two beer podcasts. Uh, two beer podcasts. And he doesn't have a bottle opener in his house. I had to go to my car because of course I've got one in my car. 
<laughs> Who doesn't? I and, so. uh, 45 good. degrees, right? I like your glass. Yeah. Yep, 45 degrees. There you go. Now, yeah, you want to pull up because the head's not super thick. No, no, pull up, pull up, pull up. Pull up. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. Wow. No. <laughs> it really came in there at the end. That's good, though. So that's actually pretty perfect, Dennis. Oh, all right. You'll, once you kind of pour one. a lot of different beers and different styles, you'll kind of get used to it. The head will start chasing at different speeds depending on how the beer was brewed. So sometimes it takes a long time for it to get up there. And sometimes it all of a sudden just goes, wah, and it'll spill all over the place. I actually did a quick pour yesterday. I haven't edited it yet, but uh, uh -huh. the beer just completely overflows <laughs> out of the glass. Actually, it looks pretty cool. <laughs> Hold on. I want to look at some of the the questions here quad guy personal yes i love quads i've heard some somebody told me once that quads are actually uh not really a belgian style because you got doubles triples and quads i heard they were actually developed in the u.s but i don't, I don't know if that's true or not uh let's see i, I thought he was I talking used about counter, countertop for my bottles <laughs> i've done that before uh, I, dude you got to be careful if you've got like uh what's that cheap countertop called where it's you know, it's got like the coating on it. It's not like real marble. You know what I'm talking about, Dennis? Wait, wait, Formica. Wait. For, uh -oh. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> if you do it, if you open your bottle on a Formica countertop, uh -huh. one time I like ripped the side of the countertop off. <laughs> <laughs> that was not good. See, uh, when uh, Joe said quad guy, I thought he was talking about working out his quads. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know he was actually talking about. Joe doesn't have any quads. <laughs> He's got quarters. <laughs> he doesn't have quads. <laughs> Alexi says, my, my mom gave me my first bottle opener when I was 14. She didn't know it was a bottle opener. What did she what? think it was? What's yeah, what heck? did she think it was? <laughs> Let's see. From Micah. Oh, yeah. Well, not helpful now. All right. I want everybody to post. Uh, I know Joe kind of already stole this for the at the very beginning of the chat everybody post where you live i want to see where everybody's from i think we have a variety i know we got somebody from it. ikea <laughs> i purpose no, so i don't i'm pretty poor, sure he's poor, not poor. from ikea <laughs> oh, my bad <laughs> i uh um we per so we did this earlier four o'clock time purposely because i had we've got a, a small fan base in europe actually I and mean, they're complaining that our premiere was way too late for them. So we got uh, 4 o'clock is like 3 a.m. Well, no, our normal time was 3 a.m. This is more like, what time is it over there? Midnight or something? Let's see. Uh, All right, let's see what we got. We got North Dakota. North Dakota. Brazil. Yeah. Joe's in a townhouse. Oh, that's helpful. Finland. Port, port. Yeah. Lexi from Finland. Oh. <laughs> Such this one's dork. classified. Dom, tell us if you're drinking beer right now. <laughs> San Diego. Oh, Shannon yeah. San Diego. Yeah. Hey, Palm Bay. Represent. Palm Bay. Palm Bay. Cool. We got a nice little uh, mix of people. All right. So let's see uh, even water. Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Let's get to our first topic. Uh, most basic thing that you should know about beer, that it's actually separated into two general categories. Uh, one category is lagers, and one category is ales. Dennis, can you tell us what the difference between a lager and an ale is? Uh, one was created by Lincoln. What? No. <laughs> so, excellent guess, but no. no. no uh, I was really hoping that, that that's where Lincoln lagers came from. Like lagers, no. Uh, the, the the lagers are uh, lagers and ales are basically separated by the type of yeast that's used. So we'll go through the brewing process in a minute, but essentially you brew your beer and then uh -huh. you ferment your beer. So when you brew the beer, you're basically making sugar water, right? And you take that; it's called a wort. You put that in a container uh, to ferment. And when you ferment, you're basically throwing yeast in that sugar water. The yeast eats the sugar, turns it into alcohol. Well, during that process, the yeast 
has uh, a huge impact on the flavor of the beer and obviously the alcohol content. And uh, lagers are cold fermented. So they, they ferment th that lagers ferment at a colder temperature because the yeast will die at warmer temperatures. Uh, and uh, it's the yeast actually sinks to the bottom. So they call it bottom fermenting. Ale yeast floats to the top. It's bottled, or uh, I'm sorry, fermented at uh, lower temperatures. Higher temperatures. I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> hey, Dave, can you do me a favor and clip your mic to your shirt? Why? Does it sound crappy? I think it's trying to pick you up, and then it keeps going higher and lower. Okay, hold on. I'm not a professional, guys. <laughs> hold on. Maybe I should do it like this. There we go. How's that? Yeah, that's the, uh, I think it's okay. Let's see how it, how it works. All right. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is ales ferment at a higher temperature, warmer temperature, lagers at a cooler temperature. Well, anyway, this gives us our two basic categories. So there's tons of styles that are lager styles and tons of styles that are ale styles. There's uh -huh. actually a lot more ale styles, but the lager ones, even though there's less, way more common. So pilsners, uh, adjunct lagers, light lagers, Bud Light and all that, that's all lagers. Um, a lot of German styles are lagers. Uh, although lagers are, are a newer category because, you know, before her, uh, refrigeration was the thing. Lagers weren't a thing. So ales were the only thing you would, you would find back, you know, historically. All those ancient beers from our ancient beer episode, those are all ales. Horrible, disgusting ales, but ales <laughs> nonetheless. So, all right. You, so there's our basic. Uh, are you trying to say ales. that you're a, a lager fan? No, I, no, no, no. I love ales. I'm just saying the ales back from the Mesopotamian and uh, ancient Egyptian times we're discussing. They're basically like these nasty baskets filled with like chunks and crap. And, and they would drink these. You remember from the episode, they they do straws and like drink them communally from like the bottom. And this nasty yeah, but place. isn't taste subjective. So you might be saying it sucks, but other people out there might be like, oh, that's the best beer I've ever had, even though it's. You are absolutely right, Dennis. And uh, uh, I would imagine if I lived back then, I would freaking love it. I mean, I mean it'd be the only option so you have, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's either that or like poison water in the water <laughs> hole. All right. Uh, so next I want to talk about where does beer come from traditionally? There's a lot of different countries that brew beer. Obviously, in the U.S., we have a huge craft beer scene. It's sad because up until very recently, the U.S. has always had a reputation for having terrible beer. I bet you most of you guys who are in Europe will probably say the United States has awful beer. But we have amazing beer now, you know, as of 30 years ago when the craft beer movement started. Do but we traditionally, produce what's the that? Most? Do we produce the most craft beer? That's a good question. We actually do produce the most craft beer, but we do not produce the most beer in general. Hold on. I actually have a slide. Let's see. Ah, look at this. Yeah. This is actually pretty crazy, I think. So we're the number two producer of beer by volume in the world. China's number one, which isn't surprising because they're massive and they're huge beer drinkers. They drink a ton of beer. But uh, Brazil Really? I, I would have Mexico, never guessed that, to be honest. What, that China would be number one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, dude, they're huge in beer. They, they have, uh, uh, I think Snow is the name of their biggest brewery, like S-N-O-W. And uh, it, I think they produce more beer than any other brewery. That, that you have to double check me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. Uh, I thought it was crazy that Brazil and Mexico were number three and four, though. I mean, I don't think of either of those two countries when I think of beer. Um, we might have to do a history of uh, Mexican beer. I, I actually would like to. Mexico's got a pretty interesting beer history. They have uh, heavily influenced by German uh, beer. So, and then Germany makes sense. Uh, Japan and Russia, I mean, most of these actually make sense to me. United Kingdom, Vietnam, I never would have guessed that. That's pretty nuts. <laughs> Bobby, China is number one for beer and terrorizing the world. <laughs> All Thank right. Well, point. we already know that the Beer History Podcast would not be listened to in China. <laughs> We're probably already banned. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hey, uh, Joe makes a, a good point here. 
in the comment section what? that, uh, he, you know, he's pretty much saying that most of these that produce a lot of beer are close to water. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm wondering if that has anything to do with it. <laughs> it's funny when you look at a, a lot of the big beer campaigns, they always point out how great their water is like oh it's the special ingredient is the water <laughs> which all joking aside the water is actually pretty important but it's just like terrible advertising in my opinion all right let's see uh hold on i'm just getting distracted by the side comments <laughs> no, no, no. let's see uh, you haven't known by now that dave likes to go into tangents i get super confused this is all unedited too. So <laughs> we assume all you drink is Bud Light. Blame ads. It is. They make really good commercials. I, I can't even pretend they don't. Horrible they make good beer. commercials once a year. Come on. I know, but they're, they're pretty funny though. <laughs> or I like the whole the whole night, the Bud Night Light, the Bud Light <laughs> Night. I can't even say it. That was a funny ad campaign. They're horrible though. I just remember in their last Super Bowl ad, or maybe it was two years ago, they did this whole thing where they were like. Oh, you know, we don't put uh, uh, corn in our beer. Oh, no. yeah, we don't corn syrup. They're saying we don't put corn syrup in our beer. And uh, in the background, they show these giant vats in like this in the castle. It was the whole Bud Light night thing. And one of them was was rice, which rice isn't isn't necessarily a bad ingredient for beer if you're like you know a Japanese brewery that's trying to use traditional <laughs> ingredients. Me. But uh, it's a really cheap, crappy grain in general. I mean, barley is expensive and rice is not. And that's the reason they put it in there. So while they're making fun of corn syrup, they're like pointing out that they're also using this alternative terrible method to brew their beer. But uh, dilly dilly. <laughs> All right. Um, it's just terrible, 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 terrible. Our water mineral con concentration is best. That's the big thing about water. Uh, Lamus pointed out the uh, the mineral content in your beer has a lot to do with the style that you're brewing and how it it affects it so if you if you look throughout all these different countries and you see what their traditional beers are which we're about to talk about uh a lot of that has to do with their local water sources so like a, one of the famous ones is porters english porters uh i don't ask me what the actual minerals are specifically for that style that make it uh viable in that area but the, their water source is is uh predisposed to make really good porters. I mean, you get the flavor profile that you're not going to get from other places. Now, that being said, nowadays, a lot of major breweries, and back when uh, uh, I was doing Crane Creek Ale Works, our, the brewery that we were starting up years ago, uh, we did tons of water treatment for the different styles. So if we were brewing this, we'd, we'd add different minerals you know, beforehand to get the water right. Then we'd brew the beer. Uh, and I think a lot of home brewers don't realize that that makes a big difference. You, know, you can't just use, use tap water and cross your fingers. You might get lucky, but um, all right, let's see. Uh, I'm going to get, I'm just going to keep looking at, I got to stop looking at the comments for whenever we <laughs> move on. So, okay. So our major beer brewing here, we can get rid of this. Our major beer brewing countries are uh, the U S as I said, now we've, we've actually created several styles that, that didn't exist before, but they're, it's kind of funny because our, our major styles we've produced are the American pale ale, the American IPA, uh, the double or imperial IPA, uh, and then the American barley wine. But was when you look the, at, was it Moose Piss one of them too? Moose Piss? No, that's Canadian. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> like, okay. like Jimmy Carrey Georgia said, Canadian beer is the best. <laughs> uh, I, I always hear people refer to beers as Moose Piss, so I thought it was a style. No, no, no. We we do have a lot of moose piss beer in the United States, but I can't say that I can't say that we invented it though. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so what's funny is American pale, American IPA, American barley wine. If you look at traditional British beers that they develop, it's the pale ale, the IPA, the barley wine. And then they've also done the, the stout and the porter and others, but uh, they're not the same though. So it sounds like the same. Pale ale and English pale ale, uh -huh. uh, American pale ale and English pale. They're they're if you if you take an English like a, a Bass ale, if you've ever had Bass ale, fantastic beer. I love that beer. I could drink it every day. Real easy to drink. If you take a Bass pale ale and then take a uh, Sierra Nevada pale ale, which are both called pale ale, they're 
completely different. Sierra Nevada pale is an American pale. It's like hopped like crazy. Like the background we have in this video right now. Uh, I mean, they just hopped the, the living crap out of it. An English pale ale is much more mild. It's got a bitterness to it, but it's like, uh, it's a lot easier to drink. You know, it's more, um, I don't know, uh, mild's the best term for it, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm lacking a better term, but um, it's, it, you can crush a Bass Pale Ale where most people would have trouble drinking uh, an American Pale Ale, especially if it's not something they're familiar with. And then when you go to the IPA, the American IPA, it's amped up even more. American beers, uh, craft beer traditionally is extremely strong. Uh, if you've never heard of a barley wine, American barley wine, or you've never had one before, if you like uh, IPAs or pale ales, you definitely got to try one. A, a barley wine, American barley wine is like hops up to here, but then the malt bill is up to here too. So you get like a sweet malty backbone that balances out the bitter hoppiness. But it's like times a million on both sides. They're so good. I love barley ones. Dang it, I should have got one for to drink during the show now i want one this I, is really good but i know earlier you said uh it's a it's a good beer or something like that you said something about uh enjoying a certain type of beer and uh i i guess my question is what do you consider a good beer and why like does it have to be very hoppy does it have to have a strong aftertaste well that's a good question i mean of course mostly that question is going to come down to personal preference but yeah, but for you, like, for what, me, what do you enjoy? For me personally, I'm like every, I'm all over the place with beer. There's not really, there aren't too many styles that I'm not a fan of. Uh, New England IPAs or uh, hazy IPAs, those are like the big trend right now. They have been for a little while now. Uh, now I'm not a huge fan of those, but outside of that, and I'll, I'll still drink them, but you know, sometimes I want a super bright, hoppy, bitter beer. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a Belgian triple, and and those tend to be not overly hoppy. This one actually is. It's an American Belgian triple. They actually say this isn't even a real style. It actually says American Belgian triple at the bottom, which I think is kind of funny. But this is by Copper Tail. It's actually a brewery in Florida. But it's almost like a Belgian triple mixed with an IPA. Um, but uh, Belgian beers have like this kind of spicy flavor to them. Uh, not like hot spicy, but like spices, you know, like coriander and, and uh, things like that. Uh, so sometimes that's what I want. And some of them could be really boozy where they're high in alcohol, but then you've got like wheat beers, uh, or, or lagers that are just like crisper, lighter, you know, easier to drink. Sometimes a certain style goes well with a certain food that I'm eating. I mean, it's such a loaded question. There's a million different things. I it think the like, real answer uh -huh. it's more universal though, would be, uh, quality, you know, I mean, you can have two different beers of the same style and you can have a cheap crappy version that they kind of cut corners on. And then you have the real legitimate version where they did like the, the more elaborate expensive style brewing style and, and you know, the ingredients are better quality and you're just going to get a better product. So that's my main thing is quality. I just want it to be good quality, you know, in the chat, I'm saying hazies are the best. Uh, somebody's a pale ale guy. Somebody oh, doesn't man. like sours. People love hazies. I'm telling my <laughs> wife, Alexis, loves hazies. Let's see. I'm more of a pale ale guy. Yeah, I, I agree. A, pale ales are great. I, I don't really – I haven't heard the term hazy. What, uh, is there a specific brand that's pretty popular right now that's a hazy type beer? Pretty much every major brewery has got a hazy IPA mm -hmm. now. They all do. And uh, it's an IPA, right? A traditional IPA pours clear. Right, you can see through it, kind of like this. This one actually is a little hazy. This is a bad example, but uh, hazy IPAs have uh, uh, like fresh hops in them. They they end up like kind of cloudy, like you can't see through to the other side of the glass. They tend to have like kind of a a sweetness to them that uh, I'm just I'm just personally not a big fan of. But they're they're hugely popular. I mean. Uh, it's worth trying for sure because most people seem to like them a lot. Uh, let's see. Oh, sours. No, I, I like sours. I think sours are great. It's hard to drink a whole sour though. Sometimes like some sours are really sour. Like it's like drinking a lemon. Uh, but then others are kind of sweet and juicy. Voodoo Ranger, hazy, juicy IPA. That's a really popular one. Yeah. If you guys want to try a new England IPA, you could almost definitely find that. 
you know, in your shelves. I know in Florida, it's really easy to find. Uh, do, do you guys, I, I'm really curious, you guys in Europe, uh, do you guys see hazy IPAs at all? Is that even a thing over where you guys are? I'm, I'm curious. It's huge here. All right, let's see. Okay, so well, people type. Um, so stouts and porters, those are English styles. Those are pretty uh, uh, interesting styles, right? I'm sure most of you have seen a stout or a porter. They're usually black or super dark brown. Oh, like this? Like they look a lot like that, although that's not a stout or a porter, but that's, that's kind of the look. Um, there's a few subcategories of both of them, which I'm not going to get into all that. But uh, essentially uh stouts were originally a subclass of porters so porters are this super dark heavy malty beer like this bready chocolatey uh coffee kind of flavors but they were lower alcohol right like four percent and uh stouts so like a lot of these breweries in england they would brew these beers and they would they would brew them at different gravities which means your your final beer is going to end up having a uh a different alcohol content based on, on the gravity at the beginning. And you get these high alcohol beers that would come out and they would call them stout porters. So it's like, Oh, well, this one's much higher on alcohol than the ones we usually brew. So we're going to call it a stout porter. So uh, eventually it turned into its own style. And then you ended up with uh, Russian Imperial stouts, which legend has it. Uh, the, uh, the English brewed, these stouts for uh, I don't remember who exactly it was. It was some Russian, uh, uh, what do they call it? An oligarchy, the the, the Russian uh, royalty, and uh, these these stouts were super high in alcohol content, like nine percent, something like that. Um, I mean, black as tar, and allegedly the story was they had to transport it over a long distance. So they made it higher in alcohol that way it would withstand the journey. I don't know how true any of that is. You're a similar story with the IPA because they had to travel to India, but a lot of it's kind of garbage. Uh, it's a fun story, but anyway, uh, legend has it that they loved this beer so much that they ordered like a huge amount that like it became this major export from, from England to Russia. And uh, they ended up naming it the Russian Imperial Stout which kind of makes sense. So I love, actually, the shirt I'm wearing right now, Old Rasputin. Man, if you guys want to try some serious beer, like heavy-duty, hardcore beer, Old Rasputin is just absolutely fantastic. It's it'll, it's like punch, getting punched in the face with a beer, but in a good way. So that's a great beer. Um, so that's English beers. German beers, that's another big one. So we've got the U.S. for craft beer. We've got England, lots of traditional beers. England actually was one of the first countries to commercialize beer and sell it on a large scale. Uh, Bass actually is, has a huge history with advertising and stuff like that. You can find old Bass beer advertisements from hundreds of years ago. It's really cool. Uh, German beer, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with German beer. I love German beer. I've gotten big into it in the past couple of years. Uh, by American beer standards, a lot of German beers might seem mild. Honestly, everything seems mild compared to American beer standards. American beer is very hardcore uh, flavor-wise. But, uh, you know, Germany, you have like a German pills. You have the Hefeweizen. Uh, there's a variety of Bach beers. My Bach, Doppelbach, which is one of my favorite beer styles on the planet. I love Doppelbachs. Uh, Eisbach, that's a really interesting style. And Eisbach, they actually take a Bach beer or a Doppelbach and they will freeze, partially freeze the beer. And they'll like, so these ice crystals form and then the ice crystals don't contain any alcohol. It's just frozen water. They scoop off the ice crystals and then the what's left is just super concentrated high alcohol beer now. So Eisbachs aren't super common. I've noticed, I actually have asked around uh, Joe uh, Yarbrough on the, on the chat here. You, you might remember him from our first episode. He was our guest. Uh, we've gone around to several different local breweries, and we've we've done his show. I, I help co-host the show sometimes, drinking and driving. And uh, I've asked so many times, do you guys do Eisbach? Do you ever think about doing an Eisbach? Because to me, I'm like, you could take any beer style. I mean, it's traditionally done with box, which is great. They, they come out awesome. I've never seen anyone do it with another style. 
What about an eyes IPA or a barley wine or something like that? And uh, I asked around, and what are the breweries we went to? I honestly I can't remember which one. Uh, Joe just posted it, freeze distill. It's technically a form of distilling. So it's not legally something you can do as a brewery in the U.S. Wait, what? Sucks. Because I think it would be so fun. Back when we were doing Crane Creek, that was one of my big ideas. I'm like, oh, we're going to Eisbach every style we do. Because I'm thinking you could just take a gallon of it, do a test batch of it, see what it tastes like. You could do it with every one of your beers that you brew and see which ones come out good. I feel like a lot of them would come out really cool. I'm confused. Why is it illegal? Because... It's not illegal. It's illegal if you're a brewery. A brewery can brew beer, but they cannot distill. It's it's considered making liquor. So you have to be a distillery. Is so that like I guess, uh, the whole moonshine thing? I'm. It's kind of like that. I mean, moonshine is, I think what you're talking about is people doing it at home, which technically you can, you can distill and brew at home, I think, in most states. I, you can do you can brew in every state now, but uh, distilling might be illegal in some uh, some states. But my point is, is uh, if you were going to do this commercially, you would have to be a licensed distillery. And I don't think this is something that's on any distillery's radar, unless they happen to do beer and liquor, which there are some. Like um, Rogue is a big one. Rogue Brewery. They also make liquor. I've got a. Uh, I don't think it's over there. I would have gone and grabbed it. They, I have a gin that that Rogue made. It's like a pink gin. It's really good. But uh, I mean, if I was Rogue, I'm, I'd be like, okay, well, I can brew beer. I can distill liquor. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm going to do this, you know, but nobody's done it yet. I think it's a great idea. Steal it. Somebody can steal it. Eyes Bud Light. No, I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it would make it better. Who knows? Eyes Bud Light. Uh, anyway, long tangent there. Um, <laughs> Doppelbox, though, favorite beer style. I just got to do a shout out to Doppelbox. Everybody go get a Doppelbox. There's so many good ones out there. Um, Octoberfest. Right, well, I, I'm completely in the dark. What What would you recommend if I was going to go get a Doppelbox? Is there a particular one that you prefer, or is it? Just... Yeah, there's a real easy one to find. Is Spaten makes one. It's called. Wait, what? Uh, it's called Spaten. That's a German brewery. Okay. It's called Optimator. It looks like it says optimator. Like okay. I have to t- I do it with the. Yeah, Can I do it in the Arnold voice? The Arnold optimator. Voice. Optimator. It's the optimator. <laughs> Get to the chopper with the six pack. <laughs> I would say that's probably the easiest one to find. Or Celebrator. That's that's made by Anger. It's A Y I N G E R. I think. Uh, that one's fun too because when you get uh, Celebrator. The bottle has this little, like, red string with a little plastic ram h- hanging from it. Because for some reason, the word Bach, I don't know if it actually means ram, like the animal. But Bach beers are always associated with rams. Bach, Doppelbach, any of that stuff. Doppelbach uh, means double Bach. It's like a heavier, higher alcohol Bach. I thought you were so, talking about computer ram. I was like, what? Different... <laughs> so it's, it's not associated with computer ram. Although, you know, that'd be a funny advertising campaign for a uh, box beer. Just have like ram, like little sticks of ram. People would be like, what? <laughs> bark, 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 Some people bark, would get bark, it, bark, <laughs> bark, 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 bark. Oh, another common one is uh, Shiner Bach from Texas. That's not a Doppelbach, though. That's just a regular Bach. It's like much lighter. Doppelbachs are way better than regular Bach, in my opinion. Good question. Um, Thanks, Teach. <laughs> uh, Oktoberfest slash Marzins. They're essentially the same thing. Everybody's heard of Oktoberfest beer. Even you know what Oktoberfest beer is, I imagine. Yeah, Venice, yeah, right? yeah. That's a traditional German style. Uh, Hefeweizens, that's a German wheat beer. Uh, and then uh, Rauch beer is a really cool style. That's a smoked German beer. These are all beer styles from Germany. There's actually a ton more. How do you Germany smoke is, a beer? What's that? How do you smoke a beer? You literally smoke the malts. So the grains, they smoke the grains and then they brew the beer with it. And that smoky flavor comes through in the final beer. There's a brewery called uh, Oxlenkerla. If you guys want to know, just I, I can type. Well, I'm not going to type it in the comments because it'll take me like five minutes to figure out. No, hold on. I'm doing it anyway. I think I can spell it. Hold on. Let's see. Say something, Dennis, while I type. <laughs> so uh too late done right. anyway <laughs> all right let me 
Let me. Uh... That was weird. There my you house, go. My house just creaked. That was like, super <laughs> weird. Actually, and Curla, this is a. It's one of the oldest breweries in in Germany. They a hundred percent of the beer that they make is smoked. So they have a smoked Helles Lager, a smoked Doppelbach, which is so good. Uh, you know, a smoked Hefeweizen, all these different smoked beers, and they're absolutely fantastic. If you like smoky stuff, you should check them out. If you do not, then you'll think that they're terrible. Is it pretty easy to get in the United States, or is that? Uh... I think so. Uh, I know Total Wine, at least the Total Wine by us, has mm-hmm. like probably six different ones, which is really cool. But they're expensive. It's like uh, smoke Bud Light. Shut up, Joe. <laughs> Wait a second. I like this idea. Smoked Bud Light. <laughs> Let's uh, you know, take it to market. It's funny, okay? An eyes Bud Light, a smoke Bud Light. These are all things that would probably improve on the terrible taste. So I'm not I'm not against it. What about but, this? Uh, smoked beer with smoked meats. Yes, absolutely. That's a that's what you want to pair it with. Uh if you get a smoke that smoked Doppelbach by Oxlin Curly, you go get some like uh barbecue takeout or something like that uh-huh. some pulled pork or like some brisket i've done it before it's amazing it's such a good such a good beer pairing really really recommend it again if you don't like smoky stuff though you'll hate <laughs> it i've i've forced that beer on so many different people that i know <laughs> and it's real hit and miss so well i think didn't we on uh one episode it might not be on the episode that uh we've released yet but didn't we have like a smoky whiskey a, at the end uh, of didn't you give us a, a little taste of a smoked whiskey or a... we did we do that on a on a, a one of our episodes? I could have swore, yeah. I can't remember some, some smoked I mean whiskey. I've had I've had smoked whiskey so many different times on and off the air of shows. I yeah, but remember. it was different, you know, it's special when it's you and me. I wonder if it was uh it might have been I actually have a whiskey yeah, it was made that one. by Oxlin Curla. That might have been it. I have a really yeah. bad memory, so might have been yeah. the episode with Joe. Oh yeah, the German beer one. Yeah, we haven't that aired we have. that episode yet. No, not yet. Still in production. Yeah. Coming you're, soon. You're absolutely right. We did do that. Yep. In fact, I probably did a whole long, annoying speech about <laughs> Oxley <Oxford and> Curla <laughs> during that episode, and you guys are all gonna have to hear it again when we do it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, Germany. Let's move on. Uh, the next one is Belgium, which I know uh, Lamus is going to say something about this. He lived in Belgium for a while. So he's actually from uh, Lithuania, but he lived in Belgium for the past year. And what part of talk- uh, Germany is Belgium from? Or what? Belgium. What'd you say? What, what part of Germany is Belgium? Dennis, you're not that bad at <laughs> it. You- <laughs> is it the north side or south side? Shut up. Is there like an east and west conflict going <laughs> on? <laughs> Is that why we had the Berlin Wall? Dennis, uh, by profession, everybody has been a geospatial engineer for years. I'd just like to point that out. <laughs> I remember I asked somebody, they were like, hey, what's the capital of this? I'm like, you're the one with the geography degree. What did you tell me? <laughs> well, what is it? Do you have a, did you ever get any kind of geography degree? No, I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I, didn't I got think a software so. degree. <laughs> I wanted All to right. make money. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. So Belgian beers. There's a, probably as many Belgian beers out there as there is German beers. I'm, and I'm talking about beers that were created by uh, the country. Um, Saisons is a big one, which that's probably going to be the next episode we record. So maybe you guys have heard the whole story. I don't want to get into it because I don't want to ruin the episode, but the story of the farmhouse ale where you know, they would like brew these beers in the winter and the, or no, they brew them during the summer and then they drink them during the winter. It was for the farm hands and all this stuff. It's this whole long story. It's garbage. Bunch of garbage. Wait, what? Yeah. Well, uh, we're, we're going to have a whole episode on it. I've, I've got like hours worth of research onto this. It was something that I was like, oh, this would be a light, breezy, quick episode. And then I ended up like finding out all this dark history. We'll, we'll get to it another day. But uh, Saison's, it is a real style, and it did start in Belgium, but it's just the history of it's real foggy. Uh, Belgian pale ales, that's a real popular Belgian ale. Uh, Abbey ales, that's the big thing. Like I was mentioning before, you've got quads, triples, and doubles. Like I said, this is a triple that I'm drinking right here. Excuse me. That I'm drinking right here. (laughs) Supposedly, there's even a style called the single, 
which I just read about this today, and I do not know if this is true. Supposedly, this is so Abbey ales are actually brewed by monks in a monastery. There's only oh, like, I thought you were uh, gonna say by abbeys. No, no, <laughs> by <laughs> abbey monks. And uh, there's only like, um, I don't remember what the number is 11 beer brewing abbeys that are officially, you know, breweries in, in the world. One's actually in Massachusetts in the US, the other ones are. Mostly in Belgium. There's a couple in Germany, I think. And uh, they brew these specific types of beers. Um, and they have traditionally for, for you know, hundreds of years. And uh, supposedly the single, which you never see, you'll never see them bottled by any of these, these abbeys. Uh, they say that they brew them for themselves and they only drink them on site. So if you wanted to try one, you actually have to go to a monastery in Belgium or Germany or wherever and cross your fingers and hope that they have them available for you to drink because you can't buy them outside of there. So it's pretty cool. I, I kind of, well, I guess that, one. yeah, that was going to be my question. So can you just show up and be like, Hey, I'm here for the beer or do you have to? Like oh yeah, absolutely. They, uh, most of these places like, uh, West of Letterans are real popular and I'm not saying that right. It's actually pronounced completely different. Uh -huh. That's how it's spelled though. Uh, and then, uh, St. Bernardus is another one. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of them. They're really popular. Uh, these, uh, these monasteries actually allow you to come on site. You can buy the beer from them. Some of them have rules where you have to like fill out a waiver saying, I'm not going to resell this anywhere. It's just for me and, and family and friends or whatever. Okay. Uh, one of them I looked into, you can actually stay at the monastery for a couple of days for 10 bucks a night or something. Wow. But you actually have to participate in the day to day stuff that the monks do, which I think would be actually really fun. Uh, hold on. Let me see. Uh, the I was uh, recently watching the uh, Nick's Karate Kid because it's on Netflix, and I had forgotten about that scene. Is that, is that with Will Smith's kid? No, 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 the one with Hillary Swank, and uh, Mr. Miyagi takes her to like a, a monastery with monks and stuff, and she tries to kill the cockroach, and they, you know, they all. Oh get yeah! With her. Oh my god, that was a terrible yeah. movie. It what? So it was so bad. Ugh. I, I think I remember okay. that though with the cockroach. I'm not gonna say it's the the best Karate Kid movie, but I mean it's uh... not. <laughs> Hold on, I'm trying to read the. Let me read the the Trappist breweries dominate the market here. It's having, yeah. By the way, not Abbey Trappists. Abbeys are overseen by monks, not in any specific location. Oh, I've never looked at. I've never looked into the difference between Abbey and Trappist. That's interesting. <laughs> David, how do you properly pour a Guinness from a can? Oh, I know why he's asking this. This this it's actually my father on the line here. Uh he went to the Guinness Brewery. So he was super excited about it when he got back. I I really want to go actually. Uh I've heard several different people say that it's actually one of the most awesome brewery tours they've been on. Uh we all know which karate kid is the best. Bonsai! The original one, I imagine. I oh you she's I'm guessing that's the second one <laughs> I... we're talking about <laughs> when they go to Japan. That's an awesome movie. Yeah, that was pretty good. Dude, Cobra Kai was good this season. I'm just saying. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. If what? Hilary Swank shows up, I'll start watching. But... Dude, they've brought every person from every movie, and I wouldn't be surprised if she's in the next season. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, another style worth mentioning from Belgium is uh, um, Lambics. Lambics are a pretty major style. Those are like, uh, they're not yeah. all fruited, but the, the ones that you're most likely to see in the U.S. are fruited Lambics. So like Crick Beers, which is like a cherry Lambic. And then there's, Ooh, that sounds there's Fromwa, which is like a raspberry Lambic. They're super good beers. They're uh, like, I really like the, the flavored, you know, the fruity flavored drinks. Even Dude, I way. gotta get I gotta get you a lambic. I want to see if you like it. Do you like cherry stuff? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Dude, I'm gonna know, get you. I'm gonna get you a Creek beer. They're they're absolutely awesome. I mean, real heavy dark fruit flavor. Super my favorite beer. was always getting a mojito, especially mo a, a blackberry mojito. mojito. But you like uh, uh, my, you like minty stuff? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I, I'm okay with it, but I I do like the mojitos. I find it very refreshing. And uh, my co-host Rob from Two Guys Drinking would always say that's a gateway drink because uh, <laughs> before you know it, you'll start drinking Sex on the Beach and Slippery Nipples and all other good stuff. <laughs> I was like, dude, don't judge my drinking. 
<laughs> I will judge your drinking, by the way. <laughs> I'm fine with some of those drinks. I mean, if it's uh, the right environment, you know, but Delirium Red is great. That is an awesome beer. Delirium Red. Uh, Delirium, you guys might know Delirium Tremens. That's kind of their flagship beer. Delirium is a, a, a Belgian brewery. They make awesome beer. Uh, correction. Delirium is great. They're both, I mean, they're awesome. Both of them are awesome. Um, there's also Nocturnum, and they make all, they make a bunch of different beers you can get here in the U.S., which is cool. Um, so the only other country that, that I'm going to mention is uh, uh, the Czech Republic, or formerly the Czechos, or Czechoslovakia. They, uh, they actually have, this is pretty interesting. So the one beer that the Czech Republic is famous for is the Czech Pilsner. They there's literally a city in the Czech Republic called Pilsen. The name Pilsner means from Pilsen. I mean, it's literally named after the city. Um, and Pilsners, Czech Pilsners are fantastic, clean, crisp, easy to drink beers. They have a lot of flavor, but they're light. And uh, um, what's interesting is if you look into Czech beer, there's a ton of different beers that they develop that nobody outside of the Czech Republic would ever have any clue about. And hold on, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a picture here. Let's see. If is I, it I is it because do they it. don't produce it or they don't distribute it internationally? Or I think so. I think it's like, uh, hold on, how do I bring this up? Dennis, make the picture go on the thing. There we go. Okay. So oh, look at all small. those. Yeah, do yeah, do the big view. Look at look at all the names of these. Go ahead and try to pronounce one, Dennis. Uh, I think I'll pass. Slevit <laughs> Pinci Pivo. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, sure. Paulo so, Tambavi Lezivak. Pork, pork, pork. Svetli <laughs> Lezik. Potolomavi Lezik. I can't do it. Uh, so here's the thing. The the Czechs, they don't name their styles. How do I word this? They, so I was just reading, this is brand new to me, so I'm not definitely not an expert on this. The names of their styles are based on the color and the strength, I guess. Okay. So it would be like if we called our beers like uh, heavy red beer or, you know, light, uh, I don't know brown beer <laughs> i wish and i could translate these styles brown beer into and English. not so brown beer <laughs> i think it would be super interesting to i'm going to probably do this at some point unfortunately this was an image and it wasn't selectable text or i'd bring it to google translate but uh their naming convention based on their styles is not like any other country nobody else did what they did Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not just like a style name. It's like a descriptive name of what you're getting. That's, this is how I understand it at least. But it's not just the, you know, uh, they call it, hold on. Uh, it's a, oh, that's right. Uh, no, it's not Bavarian Pilsner. Is it? Is that right? Did I put that down right? That's the name of the, that's what they call it. You typically call it a Czech Pilsner. But uh, delicious. Bavarian? I like Bavarian donuts. Bavarian donuts, Bavarian cream. That's my... yeah. Ooh. Wait, is Bavarian cream is the white cream, isn't it? I I'm not believe so. That. Yes, I like the the Boston cream. Yeah, but isn't that a white cream too? No, it's like custard. It's like yellow. It's different. Yeah. It's, it's like completely a, like an different. Eggshell. Eggshell. It's <laughs> eggshell. <laughs> oh wait, we got somebody here that knows what they're. There Whoa, we go. Look at that. See, this is why it's good to have an international audience. I don't think he's international. I'm pretty sure no. he's uh, uh, North Dakota. Let me Remember? let me uh, speak in your native tongue. Bork, bork, bork. <laughs> bork, bork, bork. But anyway, fliegen, fliegen, fliegen. That's only Swedish. No, they're not on our they're not on our list of uh, of countries today. They don't they don't make beer. <laughs> Dude, Scandinavian beer is like mm -hmm. it's insanely expensive. It's Wait, it's just absolutely absurd. Why is it expensive? What, is it because of the ingredients that they use, or is it just because they're charging ridiculous amounts of money? I think it's – I'm not 100% sure, but I think it might actually be a political thing. I think they tax the living crap out of it. I think it's uh, supposed to – again, 
I'm not an expert on these things. Don't quote me. But from what I understand, it's a it's a method of reducing alcoholism by making it really expensive and collecting, uh, you know, a form of collecting tax money for okay. education and other things. So, um, but one thing is for sure, living in one of those countries, for me personally, would be very difficult. Um, all right. So let's go to our next thing. We're going to talk about the brewing process. Uh, all right. So brewing is pretty simple. I'm not going to go through all the tiny details. I just want to make this nice and easy so everybody can have just sort of an understanding of what happens before their beer ends up in their can or bottle. Right. So first we have a grain, which is uh, usually barley, but it could be other stuff too. It could be wheat, uh, corn or rice, like we were talking about earlier, all kinds of grains, anything that, uh, that can ultimately produce a sugar, right? So they malt the, the grain, which basically is like, uh, you basically water the grains and allow them to begin sprouting just a tiny bit. And it releases an enzyme and there's a whole chemical reaction that happens. It's way beyond my tiny brain's comprehension, which uh, essentially when you get to the uh, mashing process, which is a couple steps ahead, uh, it allows sugars to be created during that process. So uh, you take that grain and you mill it, which means you grind it down, you remove the, sh the, the parts that you don't need, um, and then eventually get to the mash, which is kind of like the main part of the brewing process, okay? The best way to think of mashing and watering is uh, um, making tea, right? So you get your little bag of tea leaves, you take the water, you make it really hot, you steep the tea leaves inside the water, and now you have tea, right? Well, you're doing the same thing, essentially, uh, only what you end up with is something called a wort, W-O-R-T. And a wort is, uh, it's it's basically sugar water. Hold on, I even have a, I've got a little... <laughs> I got a little picture. Here we go. Oh, wait, what? So this is, these are, I dug these up. This is from like 2015 or something when we were doing Crane Creek at Works. Uh, this was our that, little, this was our little brew kettle. Is our that corn in there? Should, what's that? Is that corn? No, that's, that's barley. That's, oh. that's malted barley. So, uh, you, you, so we heat up that barley and we create this soup, right? And, uh, you, you, uh, you're laughing like you have some sort of dirty pun in your brain or something. Uh, no, I, I, re I just read Joe's comment that I ought to read out loud. What? That? <laughs> no, nope, we're not reading that out loud. <laughs> Sounds painful. <laughs> it's so stupid. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so, you know, you you, you create this, this sugar water. Let's go back. And uh, and then you... you uh, you go and move the, the wort into the brew kettle, and that's where you bring bring in your hops. Uh -huh. Right. So you hop your beer. Hops, hop, hop, hops, hops, hops. Hopping hopping your beer gives it a, a variety of flavors, of course. You know, you're gonna get your sweeter chocolates and coffees and, uh -huh. and uh, all bread and stuff. That's all coming from the grain. But the hops is gonna give you like citrusy flavors, some kind of fruity flavors, sometimes piney flavors. A lot of those like brighter, sharper, bitter flavors come from the hops. Um, what's interesting about hops is, uh, you can do a variety of things with different types of hops. So hops isn't just one thing. It's sort of like, uh, if you're familiar with wine, there's all different varieties of grapes. There's all different varieties of hops, tons of different ones. And some of them will give you bitterness. Some of them will give you flavor and some of them will give you aroma. Some of them only do one of those things and some of them do multiple things. So when you choose the hops, when you build your recipe, it's almost like doing being a mad scientist. You can come up, out with all these bizarre, uh, you know, outcomes based on what hops you use, how long you have it in the boil. So you might have it in the boil for the last 10 minutes. You might have it in there for an hour, just for 30 minutes. And then, you know, a lot of times you'll have different varieties. You'll put one in for the whole time. You'll put one in for half the time. You'll put one in only for the last 10 minutes because uh, some of them are more intense than others. So I don't know if some of you might have, have uh, drank a beer before and thought to yourself, uh, wow, this beer tastes completely different than it smelled. It smelled like one thing, but it tastes like something completely different. Well, a lot of times that's because they used a different aroma hops that gave a specific type of smell. And uh, 
something completely different is what's giving it its flavor. So you have two, two different things in the same beer. It's pretty neat. Now, well, what I was talking about earlier with pouring your beer, if you didn't pour that beer into a glass, all those aromas from that aroma hops would just be completely lost. So one of the reasons you should always pour your beer in a glass. So why do college kids always use solo cups in the movies? Well, technically you could use the solo cup as long as you get ahead. That's the important part. Technically, those college kids are doing a better job drinking their beer than somebody who drinks it straight from the can. <laughs> <laughs> those college kids are definitely trying to get ahead. They are. Hey. So, <laughs> so uh, then it goes through a, a warm chiller. It has to get cold very quickly. Then it's put in the fermentation. Fermentation, like we talked about earlier, that's where the yeast gets pitched into the into the wort. It eats the alcohol or it eats the, the sugars, turns it into alcohol. Bam. You've got beer, right? Then you go through the maturing conditioning. That's where, where it gets carbonated, uh, filtered. It gets clear um, if that's the type of beer you're making. And then you bottle it or keg it, and then you can drink it. So pretty simple process. So really the main thing to remember is the brew process, fermentation, and then bottling, right? Those are like kind of, a, if you wanted to break it down to three real simple phases. So let's see. Question, like with wine, people get chocolate notes. Is that from actual chocolate or from a hop fray? Excellent question. So they do. Sometimes they do add chocolate to beers. There's plenty of beers out there that have chocolate in them. Like I just did a quick pour, actually. It was a, a Yingling Hershey syrup chocolate porter, and they actually added Hershey syrup to that. Uh, but there are plenty of beers out there that have tons of chocolate flavors and smells that have no chocolate in them. And that actually doesn't come from the hops. That comes from the grain bill. So there's actually a type of hops called chocolate, or I'm sorry, not hops, uh, uh, grain called chocolate malt. Um, there's a bunch of different kinds of grains, just like there's different kinds of hops, like what I was just saying. There's this huge variety of grains that you get different flavors from. And they roast a lot of the grains. And the more you roast it, the more you get those chocolate coffee kinds of flavors out of them. So uh, chocolate notes would usually be from a darker toasted grain. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. That's, that's where you get those flavors from. So you do not have to add chocolate to get a chocolatey flavor. Usually when somebody adds chocolate to a beer, it's because they're trying to get it to be uh, – they want that to be an overpowering flavor, you know, like maybe a dessert kind of beer, something that you drink at the end of the day. Uh, does bottling versus canning make a difference in beer taste? That is also a great question. So you will find people your whole life that will tell you, Canned beer is disgusting. It's got to be in a bottle. It tastes different from a can, blah, 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 blah. This is a very outdated concept that was 100% true 30 plus years ago when uh, you would actually get flavor in part, imparted from the can, which sucked, right? I mean, some people like that, I guess. Uh, I mean, as of 10, 15 years ago, uh, I think Oscar Blues was one of the pioneers of, of canning for craft breweries. Everybody bottled in craft beer before then. Uh, they started canning, and people were like, what are they doing? Are they crazy? Well, they built these special cans that actually had a lining on the inside that completely eliminated that flavor that the can was imparting into the beer. So when you have this special can, it's doing nothing to change the flavor of the beer, just like a bottle. So you should have the exact same flavor between the bottle and the can. No difference. So anybody, and almost every craft brewery that, I mean, that I know of at least, I think just in general, even the big guys uh, use these cans that don't change the flavor of the beer now. So it's, it's the same thing as far as I'm concerned. And then canning is also great because uh, it's less expensive for the brewery, which means they can make the price of their beer less. Uh, it's you can stack them easier, so it's easier for transporting, easier for storage. There's all kinds of reasons why it's beneficial. Don't get me wrong; I'm not saying I don't like bottles. Bottles are super fun and they're really cool, but uh, you don't have to have your your beer doesn't have to be bottled for it to. Have I, I would story. assume, just like with soda, you know, it, it wouldn't be better in a bottle or a can. It'd be better from the machine or the draft, right? Like a fountain machine. That, now, that's a great point. Yes, absolutely. Draft beer, in most cases, is going to be better than uh, um, from the bottle of a can. And honestly, you know, it's something that I've always known. I've always noticed, you know, oh, they've got it on draft. I got to try it on draft and it's uh -huh. always better. I'm not, I'm honestly, I'm not really sure why that is. I should, that's something I'm going to look into. Uh, 
So why does Coke taste better from the can than the plastic bottle? This is the beer history podcast, not the soda history podcast. So yeah, <laughs> Dominic, I think uh, I, I do feel like it's better from the can though. That's a, that's a good question. Maybe maybe uh, plastic imparts a crappy flavor <laughs> to the into the Coke. I don't know. Is it a can? Just a giant can? You know what it damn well is, Joe. It's a giant can. <laughs> uh all right let's go to our next topic okay we're almost done wow we're going this has been an hour holy cow all right i got one I remember you were like go hey let's only do 30 minutes okay let's not go any longer than 30 minutes i'm like yeah sure sure this pal. has been more this has been more fun than i expected to be. uh all oh, right wait uh what's this say i think those types of plastics and soda bottles are capable of imparting flavor. I bet you. I bet you that's actually the case. I bet you it's like a reverse issue with with uh, soda. The the plastic, yeah, gives it a different flavor than the can. I mean, I've My, had soda in a glass bottle, and it's it's pretty good. But I I definitely would prefer the can over the bottle. It is good in a glass bottle. I like it in a glass bottle. I know uh, my wife is obsessed with. Um, She's obsessed with uh, Coke from specifically from McDonald's. Oh, okay. And somebody told me, and I don't know if this is true or not, that McDonald's actually has some sort of special deal with Coke where they have a slightly different formula than everyone uh -huh. else. It's like everybody else uses syrup and, and uh, club soda, basically soda water, and it mixes on site when you get your soda. Yeah. You know, and supposedly Coke, it's like pre mixed, but I don't know. I don't know if I believe it. it and it's like specifically BS just for Coke. It's not yeah. for any of the other Coke it's properties. Coke specifically and McDonald's specifically. But okay. again, here you go. Coke for McDonald's is a whole different conversation. Yeah. See different has a different ketchup from Heinz. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if this was true. I just don't buy it unless I see proof. That's all I'm saying. All right. So next we're going to talk about glassware and I'm going to set up as I'm talking. I want to do a quick pour on the air. Wait, what? With, yeah. I want to do a quick pour on the air with the, uh. the thing in the background. I think that'd be funny. All right. This is so, a behind the scenes, a special quick pour. I'm not going to, I'm going to talk while I'm doing it though. So that way it doesn't become extremely boring for everybody else. Uh, and now a very special quick pour with the host of the beer history podcast, <laughs> David Tataro. So uh, glassware is something that if you wanted to really get into a fun new hobby, glassware is a really fun hobby to get into. I think, um, I mean, besides the fact that uh, collecting glasses is, if you like to collect things, which not everybody does, um, it's it's a, an art form. I mean, there's so many different things out there uh, besides just the logos from all the breweries, which I think is cool to begin with. I'm a big art person. You know, I've uh, my undergrad is in digital media, so I've always had sort of uh, an interest in these kinds of things, uh, advertising and stuff. Um, but also the glasses themselves, and there's tons of traditional glasses for all different styles of beers from all around the world. And these are, these are glass styles that have some, some of them have been around for hundreds of years. And, uh, and some of them serve a specific purpose in the way that they affect the beer. And some of them don't, some of them are just kind of, Oh, this is really cool. It's just a cultural traditional thing that they did. And uh, I'm gonna, this is my biggest problem. This is I can't do two things at once. So I was like, Oh, I'll multitask. Not much of a multitasker. Um, so, all right, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna focus on this quick pour until I'm done talking about glassware. So, uh, Pilsner glass is is a real common one. So I'm just gonna. There's so many different glasses out there. I'm not gonna cover all of them. Um, this is a, a typical Pilsner glass. They're usually straight all the way up. They're tall and they're skinny. And the purpose of a Pilsner glass is to uh, it's to display like the color of the beer and the carbonation. So. Uh, pilsners and, and, and lagers tend to have uh, a higher level of carbonation and you'll see little bubbles going up the whole time after you pour it. And it's neat because it's sort of like almost a test tube. So you see the, get to see the bubbles travel all the way to the top. And then it's got, since it's so long and skinny, the head's going to end up being a lot thicker vertically than it would be in a normal glass. And uh, a lot of pilsners, some of them have super thick heads. 
but uh, they don't always. A lot of times they have less of a head than other styles. Uh, but having a thinner glass allows it to look like it has more head than than actually does. Uh, that's a super cool glass. Then you've got a Wizen glass, which is real similar. The big difference between the two is uh, obviously the bulb at the top. So Wizen glass, Wizen means wheat in German. So uh, they tend to have a much thicker, creamier head. So by widening the top, it's a lot, it's able to kind of contain that head without it being, it's sort of the opposite effect without it filling the whole entire glass uh, vertically. So, and uh, uh, the, our glasses that we have for the beer history podcast. Yeah. So specific? that, this is what you would call a, 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 I mean, they have all different names. It's not really a traditional glass. Uh, I've seen it called a uh, craft pub glass. So it's kind of a, pu a pub glass would be, Kind of any slightly tulip shaped, uh, you know, beer glass that's not just straight. Um, it has a little bit of a curve to it. Uh, the reason I picked these when I designed our glass, there's a the specific reason. This is a smaller than normal glass. So I don't have a regular pint glass here, but most pint glasses are actually about 20 ounces. They're meant to hold a 16 ounce beer plus the head. But if you pour, like, so if you buy, a nice looking glass from a brewery. That's usually what it is. But then when you pour a 12 ounce beer in it, there ends up being all the space at the top, which I hate. That sucks. So this glass is actually about 16 fluid ounces to the top, which means you can put up, I'm trying not to cover my face. It means you can pour a 12 ounce beer in it and you'll get the perfect amount of head right to the top of the glass. So they're not very common. I've got one from Sierra Nevada. That's, that's a, uh, a 12 ounce beer glass and uh, I've seen them once or twice, but I don't know why they're not more common in the U S all beer is 12 ounces in the can or bottle. Just about it's super rare to find a 16 ounce beer. So you can see these other glasses, right? So this, this, this glass is from a brewery from uh, I believe they're from the Czech Republic or, or from Slovakia or something. Uh, this one's uh, a German Hefeweizen glass. So it's a Brooklyn brewery, which is a U.S. brewery, but these are huge glasses. You're going to pour a 12 ounce beer in these and they're going to be up to here. So a lot of European glasses are, are either very small or they're very big because they don't have 12 ounce beers typically like we do. Um, I'm pretty sure they don't. So those are some pretty common styles. You guys already saw my goblet. They also have snifters. Snifters tend to have like a short stem, but they're very similar. And a snifter, they're, you, if you have a, if you're a brandy person, you drink brandy or whiskey. I was gonna you say can, if you're like a super villain, <laughs> or a super villain, yes, <laughs> that's usually what they have. A fancy super villain. So the point of it is, you can put your hand around it, and you actually warm up whatever is inside. So if you're a whiskey drinker, or or a, you drink cognac or brandy or something like that, uh, it actually is better to to have it warm than cold because you get more flavor out of warmer anything right this is another big tip for anything beer uh liquor wine whatever you're drinking the colder it is the more muted the flavors are going to be and sometimes you want that sometimes you don't want that uh so snifter glasses are specifically designed for you to be able to hold it like this warm it up swirl it around uh this kind of curvature that you get in tulips and in goblets and stuff kind of holds in a lot of the aroma so when you take your sip the smell is like kind of concentrated right at the top of the glass instead of just kind of opening up to the world. So when you take a sip, you're going to smell it as you're tasting the beer. So, and so it has an effect on the flavor. And again, you're missing out on all this. If you're drinking from the bottle, like a heathen, don't drink from the bottle. Uh, and then the other one I'll talk about is uh, um, steins and, and mugs. So mugs are kind of more, um, Traditionally, they're more ornamental and cultural. They're, I, I would say that they're less uh, functional. But one thing that's good about it is you're holding it from the handle, so you're not going to warm the beer up like you would with a lot of standard glasses. So it's there's a functional side to it. But you can see this is a, a pewter moosehead mug. And I've got a traditional stein, which has the little top on it. So they say that the top, I've heard tons of times they say it's to keep flies out, but... I actually just read today, again, not sure if this is true or not, that it actually, they think that originally it was 
developed during uh, the 1500s during the Black Plague, and it was supposed to keep disease from spreading into your drink. So, like, if your bartender was like hacking up malaria all over the place, this would keep it from getting in your drink, and you could be like, "Oh, it's safe now." So, and, uh, have you only eaten or eaten? If you only drink drank, drunk or drunk I, out of metal mugs, have I ever? So I've got a few pewter mugs, but I've actually never used them. I've never drank out of them. I just use them for display purposes. I feel like it would make the beer taste bad, but I guess I should try it. I have them, right? Do they have ones that are made out of wood? They do. There's wooden steins. They're supposed to be not practical Uh, because, you know, I mean, ultimately they're going to soak up liquids and stuff like that. I don't know. I mean, I guess... It would probably be more for decorative purposes, I would say. Uh, These are kind of common to, or or traditional, I should say, uh, like stoneware, uh, porcelain, and stuff like that. And then, of course, I'm sure you guys have seen these before. You got the big ass Oktoberfest liter mug. This is a half brown mug. So, this one's great because you can pour three 12 ounce bottles in it comfortably. So if I'm like, I get home from work and I have like a real stressful day, especially if it's during Oktoberfest, I'll get like three Oktoberfest beers, pour them in there. And I'm just like, ah, where's Das Boot? You don't have Das Boot? Das Boot? I do have, I do have a boot. Yeah. So that's another traditional one. Definitely not functional. (laughs) I'm assuming you know that from the movie Beer Fest. (laughs) Remember, you have to. Twisted at the last second. That's the trick. <laughs> so stupid. That's boot. Ooh, yeah. That was such a dumb movie. But uh, yeah, so there's your general uh, rundown. So, Dennis, I'm going to try to set up this quick pour while you read through questions. All right. So, if you guys have any other additional questions, just use the chat feature, whether you're wa- watching on YouTube, Facebook, or even the Twitter. The Wait, Twitter. Yeah. Yes, we are live on Twitter. Ooh. Yeah, and I I do plan on, if you guys stick around to the very end, which will be pretty soon after I do this quick pour, I'm going to do a quick contest and see if you guys are paying attention. And we're going to give away a free Beer History Podcast class. Exclusive. I'm just saying I hope it's Joe so we can save some money on uh, shipping costs. But Joe is <laughs> not eligible. <laughs> what? He already has one. Oh, yeah, that's for right. being a guest. So we can save on shipping costs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have to ship it to one of the work work countries. <laughs> I'll ship it. I'll ship it to any of you guys, even if it's in, uh, you know, one of your wacky European countries. <laughs> All right. We got our first question here. All right. Let's hear it. What was the first beer that Dave ever had? The first beer I ever had, ever? I would, I, yeah. I would say probably either Moosehead Lager or Coors Light. Those are the two beer styles my father drank when I was a kid. So, And I know when I first started drinking, like actually drinking, not just having a couple sips as a kid, uh, Coors Light was my original go-to standard. So, um, yeah, that was my first beer. Dennis, what was your first beer? Budweiser. Budweiser. I think I was 15 or 16. I was at Puerto, in Puerto Rico. And we just Puerto went Rico. up to a bar and got a, got a Budweiser. That was, did you pick, is that what you picked? No, that's a, that's what they gave me. <laughs> that's what they gave me. You're like, <laughs> I don't know what beer is. Let me have one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I really uh, think, you know, uh, you know it'd be pretty interesting a... if we did an episode down the road. We get all our past guests back. We could do a big mega episode and all go through our first beers or first wine or first time oh, we yeah, went and like cool. did something, you know, crazy. All of our all of our special guests. All, all right. right. So I, I don't have a bottle opener upstairs. <laughs> That's not true. I have one everywhere. There's one yeah, in this closet. I would Dennis, think. Give me 30 seconds. 30 seconds. All right. Let's put the, the clock timer on. 30 seconds. I had to mute Dave because I'm pretty sure he just dropped the mic. He was like, hey, enough of that. I got to get me a, a bottle opener. 
most people don't know, but in that closet there, Dave has a fridge with a ton of beer in it. It's like one of those uh, small fridges that you can get. Nope, it's lost. Like, what? Nope, I got to open it on the counter. Counter uh, open. Here we oh, go. Oh, great. <laughs> Let's see if I break my counter. There we go. Okay. Hey! All right. Okay, I'm doing the quick pour. Here we go. There we go. You, want me to you guys all music? get to be a part of it. do 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 it's beautiful. Look at that. Look at that. Now I got to do my close up of the head. That's the important part. Oh man, we're talking about the beer. <laughs> this isn't my OnlyFans page. <laughs> there it is. Three seconds. That's how quick my quick pours take. Very easy. Look at that. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Great this work. This is uh, Left Hand Milk Stout Nitro. I don't know if you guys have ever had that before. That is a great beer. I know Joe mentioned lactose earlier. I don't remember why. He, I think he literally just said the word lactose. But uh, this is an interesting thing. If you ever see a milk stout, there's also I've seen them do it with uh, IPAs. They call milkshake IPAs sometimes. They actually put lactose in the beer. And lactose is a, a, a sugar that comes from milk. And uh, yeast won't eat it. It doesn't ferment. They call it a non-fermentable sugar. So uh, what that means is by the time you get to the final product, normally the yeast would have turned that sugar into alcohol. There's residual sugar in, in your final beer. So it ends up being, you know, having some sweetness to it. So kind of a neat concept. Uh, Mrs. Tataro says, if you <sighs> broke my desk, you're in trouble, homeboy. <laughs> oh, geez. Mm, I didn't know she was watching. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> uh, all right, here's another question. <laughs> Do you have cannabis beer in the U.S.? It's a thing in Lithuania. Yeah. I'm not sure about technique, though. It is. is so the thing, that's, the thing that's weird is, uh, so there's there's... I don't know if you can actually get beer with actual cannabis in it, but there's uh -huh. like, so hops and and uh, marijuana ha they're actually related; they're cousins. They're very similar, and uh, so it's perfectly okay for them to bang each other. It is no it depends <laughs> on the state, but uh, what what you end up having is um, uh, some hops varieties that smell a lot like weed. So there's a ton of beers that have that marketing, like. Uh, uh, Sweetwater, which is a brewery in Georgia, there's they have tons of uh, weed related beers, and you'll mm. pour some of these, and you'll be like, "Holy crap! It smells like somebody's smoking a joint right next to me." Um, but marijuana is still federally illegal in the U.S., which is insane because it's yeah. legal in tons of states. Yeah. So I don't know what the rules are with that, and I don't know if they're allowed to brew it with cannabis in it because of the fact that it's federally illegal, they might get shut down. So I don't think that that's a thing in the U S technically, Okay. but uh, yeah, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I've seen tons of cannabis beers, but I don't think any of them actually have weed in them. Some of them might have like, you know, uh, CBD oil or something. I don't know. Uh, what do you what's think the is best the cheapo beer? Best cheapo beer price wise cheapo beer. I mean, it's also going to come down to personal taste. I like, if I'm drinking a light, cheaper lager, I like Moosehead, but Moosehead's not actually super cheap price-wise. Canadian beers are an import for us. Uh, I mean, I guess I would say, I'm, some people are going to get mad when I say this. I actually kind of do like uh, Budweiser a little bit, if that's available. Regular Budweiser. Okay. And then Coors Light, again, I drank that a lot when I was in my 20s because that was my the beer my dad drank back then. So, And then Yingling. Yingling is a good cheaper beer. Yeah, I mean, that brings up uh, Joe's question here. What's Dennis's and Dave's favorite widely available beer? And I think for me, it have to be either Heineken or Yingling. I'm, Heineken I'm a pretty, Yingling? Yeah, I'm a pretty simple guy. Heineken's a good beer. I, I want you to try uh, Grolsch beer. That's the one, if you've ever seen it, it has the swing top bottles. Oh, That's yeah. That's yeah, got yeah. a similar kind of flavor to Heineken, but I think it's it's a lot better. That's a really good beer. That's what always uh, appealed to me about Red Stripe, I think it is. I've never tried it, 
I think it's a Jamaican beer. Yeah, or, they have those short Caribbean bottles. Yeah, but they they have the the cap where, you, like you said, you. I don't think which red stripe. I don't think has that cap. Oh, they, they must did. have gotten rid of it. Yeah. Um, my what's favorite, your favorite? Widely available beer, uh, like commercial beer. Are we not counting imports, or is that a? Oh, well, I guess we can count imports if it's widely available, right? Yeah. Um, I would say celebratory, but I don't know how widely available that is. I'm trying to think of something you can easily get any place. Um, Isn't there a, a certain beer from uh, Brooklyn Brewery that you really enjoy? I like a lot your- of beer from Brooklyn. Brooklyn Black Chocolate Stout's one of my favorites, but again, I wouldn't call that widely available. I yeah. guess if I want to just make things simple. Sierra Nevada Pale Ale and Sierra Nevada Torpedo IPA. Those mm-hmm. you can get almost anywhere. I know uh, uh, Lexi, who is, I don't know if he's still on or not. Uh, he's in Finland, and I know he drinks that a lot. So okay. you can get that outside the U.S. Actually, Brooklyn might be available to a lot of these European people out there because uh, last I checked, they they distribute to like 40-something different countries. So anything by Brooklyn I think is super good. They're They're one of my favorites. But, oh, you know what? A good one that you could probably find anywhere. Uh, um, Modelo. You know Modelo? Have you seen them? Yeah. Mexican yeah. Mm-hmm. They have uh, Modelo Especial, and then they have, which is their kind of standard lager. Okay. Which is a good one. That's actually good quality beer. And then uh, Modelo Negro, which is their dark beer. That okay. Is super good beer. And that's a ger- those are both German styles, too, even though they're brewed in Mexico. Uh Let's see. Cold Snap. Yeah, Cold Snap is awesome. That's a great beer by Sam Adams. Most people, I think, would like it, too. It's pretty easy to easy to drink. And and uh, that used to just be in their variety packs, but you can get it by itself now. Uh, we have Orville. Love it. Orville's really good, too. Ew, Budweiser with Clamato. Jeez. That's disgusting. <laughs> he, he's got problems. <laughs> All right. Let's do the our little contest. Hold on, I have it in my book. Um, it's my special podcast book. My friend Marion, shout out to Marion, got me this as a present. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, I remember. Okay, Joe, again, you are not allowed to answer this question, so don't answer it. You already have one of our glasses, okay? And you'll ruin it if you answer it before anyone else does. <laughs> okay. The first person who in the chat window can tell me what style beer is this glass meant for, number one. And number two, where did that, what country did that style originate or win a free beer history podcast class? This is the glass. Go. I just realized we're going to have an audio-only version of this, and if I just don't make any sound, it's going to be really boring for everyone. Come on. Well, that's why they need to this listen to this Joe knows live. the answer. Oh, Shannon said Pilsner, but that doesn't give the whole answer. you got to say the country, too. The country and the style. How about uh, what John Totaro said? Uh, Ale Belgium. Nope. That's Dominic. What did John Totaro say? Where? Uh, Pilsner, Germany. Oh, you're close. Nope. It's not Germany. Germany's not correct. Wow. Uh, <laughs> didn't you say at one point that if any beer related question came up about location, if you said Germany nine out of 10 times, it probably would be the right answer. <laughs> yes. And I purposely picked this glass knowing it was not Germany because it would oh. be too easy. <laughs> Come on. I gave a whole thing about the originating. Uh, Pilsner, uh, there we go. Wartek got it. Bohemia, which is in uh, 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 Czech Rhapsody. Czech oh, Czech. Czech. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Wartek got it. Very nice. Oh, that's good. We we only have to ship to North Dakota, we don't have to ship to uh, <laughs> Lithuania, <laughs> Austria. Come on, dad. <laughs> Pilsner in Austria, it's very good. Austria, Czech Republic, they're all the same. Post, it's all post-Soviet Prussia, right? And you know, this was this was definitely a lot of fun. I I, I could see us doing more live episodes, probably yeah, you, you know fun. more than once a month. 
I feel bad. Shannon was trying so bad. <laughs> Stupid game. I hate this. <laughs> I will buy that glass either way. We got to put, we do need to put them up for sale. We like show yeah. them in every episode. We gotta put them up. <laughs> East Germany. <laughs> That's not a country anymore. <laughs> but good guess, Nils. Oh my gosh. Pilsner, Florida, 32904. That's where I live in Pilsner, Florida. <laughs> You don't want to tell the internet where you live. Well, I just did because I'm stupid. <laughs> All right. I think we're going to end it now. This is our longest episode by far. Hopefully <laughs> it was entertaining. We've There's a lot of people on the line still, so it must not have been that bad, right? Dennis? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for uh, listening to us goof off for an hour and a half. You can see along the top. Uh, I told, told Dennis beforehand, I got to remember that my hand goes in the opposite direction on the screen that doesn't really like. if you look along the top follow us on these different social media outlets i implore you all right now to stop whatever it is you're doing actually don't stop what you're doing because what you're doing is watching this. <laughs> to multitask along with what you're doing log on to any of these platforms that you actually use and subscribe so you can get updates on our next show you don't want to miss out on the next one. If you see this one right here, that's Discord. We have a Discord community. I know a bunch of you guys are already in there. But uh, if you use Discord, hop on there and uh, check us out. Uh, our website is thebeerhistorypodcast.com, which you can get to anything from there. So if you remember anything, remember the website. Uh, and then, you know, you can watch on any of these platforms. Obviously, YouTube, we do everything video. But you can listen to it on Spotify, Google Podcasts. Apple, blah, 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 all the big guys. We're on there. So uh, that's about it. I think we're good. Got anything else, Dennis? No, that was it. But uh, if you are list- if you want to hear some more podcasts, you could always visit uh, my podcast that I do with uh, my buddy Rob, who's constantly getting in my case about <laughs> drinking beers. But anyway, it's uh, Two Guys Drinking. You can find it anywhere uh, you listen to podcasts, whether it be iTunes, Spotify, stuff like that. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Let's uh, we should plug. I know I mentioned it before. Joe Yarbrough also has, oh, yeah, that's uh, right. He was he's been our guest on a couple episodes now, and I'm sure he will be in the future. Uh, drinking and driving with an N apostrophe, uh, and then uh, relationships, um, relationships, which yeah. is him and his wife do a, a really funny podcast where they talk about uh, their relationship and, and it's, it's super entertaining. You guys should check both of those out. If you go to our podcast, the beer history podcast on YouTube, you'll see uh, getting to know Bruce as a recommended podcast. Uh, and that's, that'll bring you to Joe's shows. I gotta so say that's a, a great name. Getting yep. to know Bruce. Getting to, he's the king of puns, that guy. <laughs> All right. So that's about it. Thanks for showing up guys. We had a lot of fun and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.